Welcome to the Common Hour. This week, a panel discussion from FNM faculty titled Bodies Transgressing Boundaries. My name is Jim Strick. I'm the chair of the program in Science, Technology, and Society and a professor of environmental studies. I'd like to introduce our ASL interpreter, Emily Phipps. Thank you so much, Emily, for translating for us today. Please note that if you need to change your screen view to include Emily as you watch, you can adjust the screen display mode in the small box labeled view towards the upper right corner of the Zoom window. You can also, at the bottom, enable closed captioning, if you like. A very warm welcome to all to our 10th Common Hour of the semester. Common Hour is a unique and inclusive program that brings the Franklin and Marshall community together weekly during the academic year for culturally and intellectually enriching events. It's the only regularly scheduled event that unites students, faculty, and staff and invites the larger community to join us, including alums. Throughout the pandemic, the Common Hour has continued to be a virtual gathering space and a source of inspiration, education, and compelling discussion for the FNM community and beyond. We hope you'll join us next week as well on April 28th for the Conductors of FNM with musical performances uh, hosted by our own Professor Brian Norcross. During today's event, Zoom viewers can submit questions for our speakers via the Q&A feature. Please indicate your affiliation with the college, uh, though we do not need your name. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Jennifer Redman, Professor of German, who will introduce our faculty panel today. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jim. And welcome to all of you who have joined us for this very special um, FNM faculty scholarship oriented panel. Um, I, as Professor Strick said, I'm Jennifer Redman. I'm professor of German here in the Department of German, Russian, and East Asian Languages at Franklin and Marshall. I am so pleased today that the FNM community has the chance to learn a bit about the really truly exciting scholarly work that my language faculty colleagues are engaged in. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Amy Molnix and the Faculty Center for suggesting that we put a panel together and Cindy Wingenroth um, for shepherding our proposal with the um, Common Hour Committee. I would also especially like to thank my colleagues, Brian Fowler, Megan Tripp and Giovanna Lerner for stepping up uh, to participate today, especially at this really very of the semester. We have titled this panel Bodies Transgressing Boundaries. As you're about to hear, although these three scholars are working in media in three different languages and from three very different time periods, their topics are connected by a focus on gender, race, and sexual identities within multicultural and historical contexts. We're going to start today by having each of the three panelists give a short introduction to their research, um, about seven minutes uh, for each of them. And then from there, we will transition into a panel discussion with questions posed by me uh, to the three, the moderator to the three panelists. And then in the final 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes of the session, we'll open the floor to questions from you. So please save your questions um, and they can you can ask anything about any of the three presentations or about our discussion following the presentations. So let's get started. Uh, our first panelist is Ryan Fowler. He is a senior adjunct of classics here at FNM. His previous research has primarily explored the relationship between philosophy and sophistry in the early common era. In the last few years, he has started to work on questions related to early Greek and Roman medicine including the first commentary on a fourth century BCE Hippocratic text describing the mechanics of the human heart. So please welcome Ryan Fowler. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank professors Redmond, 
the Skinny Learner and Trip for giving me the chance to speak with you today. Uh, a number of years ago, when I first developed an ancient medicine course for Franklin and Marshall College, I wanted to make sure that I had some time to discuss women in ancient medicine. I started to think more deeply about the Hippocratic Corpus, which is the 60 or so ancient Greek texts that were mostly written in the 400s and 300s BC and are associated with the physician Hippocrates, he of the famous oath. It turns out that about 25% of these texts are devoted specifically to the diseases of women. <clears throat> and those works, it turns out, had a significant impact on women's health over the next 2,500 years or so. So eventually I increased the number of days on women in ancient medicine to as much as two weeks. But every year I teach a unit on women in ancient med medicine, um, I find a new question for my own research. So it's important to say outright that this topic includes a rather stark gender binary that by its very nature will seem antiquated. I only use it here because in effect, these ancient authors conflate gender and sex. So in this discussion, I will be using man, male, woman, female. So I begin to notice that these texts related to a research question that I've been interested in over time. To me, these texts became an oblique way of studying the status of women in the ancient Greek and Roman world. And perhaps more to the point today, they can be read as one approach to understand the status of women's bodies in antiquity. So it became important in the ancient medicine course as we read Hippocratic texts in class is how often medical language can give the impression that they provide us direct access to some objective reality hidden beneath the surface. When in fact, what these readings, the course at FNM and my own research continually remind me of is that any medical pronouncements are historically bound and should be viewed within a cultural context. So what's, re what's informed my research the most is the process of trying to uncover the various theoretical assumptions that are presented in these works in order to explain gender differences. So and with that, I will share my screen and take a sip of coffee. So in the early Hippocratic corpus, the female body was assumed to be both hotter and colder than the male body. By that, I mean the same event, namely menstruation, was proof for some authors that a woman's body was hotter because menstruation regulated the body's heat. And it was proof for other authors, as the one here on the slide, that she was colder because she lost that heat every month. So we have the same indication, but opposite conclusions and assumptions about the body. But menstruation, regardless of what it proved about the temperature of women's bodies for certain authors, was an added diagnostic tool for the Hippocratic physician. The menarche, the first menstruation, was a fraught time for these physicians. If it went well, then she was well, and she was ready for marriage, as we can see. In the quote here, if it does not happen, if that first menstrual cycle does not happen, various Hippocratic authors tell us that this unneeded retention of menstrual fluid was sign of future disease, hallucinations, suicidal thoughts, or sometimes death. So the solution we're given, however, is relatively straightforward, intercourse and pregnancy. Thus, we find in a number of Hippocratic texts, the prescription, the medical prescription, she should sleep with her husband, which is often coupled with, if she becomes pregnant, she is healthy. And I just mentioned at the bottom of the slide, the number of places that that coupling happens. So as an aside, we can easily find well into the 19th century, medical theories that reflected how male physicians are instructed to monitor and manage the regularity, flow, and proper length of time of menstruation. But what matters to my own research, as well as the ancient medicine course, is that these theories are not only often based on, but are justified by the explicit authority of the ancient Hippocratic corpus. So it became clear in my work 
and in the work of many of scholars who work on this same topic, is that the solution prescribed in these texts in one way or another and for about 2000 years after is male. In antiquity, either the, in the form of a Hippocratic physician or a husband. A little later than Hippocrates, the philosopher Aristotle will pick up on the Hippocratic strain of the cold nature of women's bodies. Endorsing the Hippocratic view that female bodies are colder than their male counterparts, he connects passivity to coldness and activity to warmth. So as a result, the female always provides the matter in conception, the male provides that which fashions it, for this is the power that we say they each possess, and this is what it is for them to be male and female. So arguing that women are neither active nor warm enough to create semen as the male body is able to, the female body is defined by this incapacity. In fact, the female body is described, again, here by Aristotle as an infertile male, or perhaps somewhat famously, the female body is described as that of a mutilated male. And this is likely why for ancient medieval and Renaissance physicians, primarily because the second century CD, CE physician Galen developed these ideas further, the female reproductive system is an exact reversed internal replica of the male reproductive system. So I'll warn you right now that I actually have an image of what that looks like in a couple of slides. So just hold on to your hats. So we can identify in these texts, male bodies and female bodies on a continuum. The female body is understood in opposition to and not quite reaching the perfection of the male body. In effect, there is the body of which the female body was an inferior version defined by its being both incomplete and defective. And next comes the striking image. So if you put all these ideas together, you begin to see how we end up living for about 1300 years with Galen's system. Galen, who was thought to be the embodiment of all medical knowledge after him until nearly the modern era. So with Galen, we have the idea in his text that the reproductive system of women is the exact inverse of that of the male body. And next to his text is a drawing, and I think it's important to mention this, of the uterus from Vesalius's De Corporis Humani Fabrica that represents Galen's description. And it's from about 1543. So that's actually a picture of a uterus. I just think it's important to sort of underline that. So I, I might end today with an example of Galen's synthesis and, and what this results in based on his application of a number of Hippocratic and Aristotelian ideas that I mentioned today. And I think it's important to read this in its entirety. For the parts were formed within her when she was still a fetus, but she could not, because of the defect in heat, emerge and project on the outside. And this provided no small advantage for the race, for there needs to be a female. Indeed, you, would, you ought not to think that our creator would purposely make half of the whole race imperfect and as it were mutilated, unless there was to be some great advantage in such a mutilation. So what drives my interest in studying these texts is that we have in many of them an expression, one might say the scientific or medical justification of the status of women in Greek and Roman antiquity, certainly in their basic or for some authors, sole roles in their reproductive capacity, all of which is validated by a rhetoric of science and based solely on the authority and theoretical assumptions of this particular group of male physicians. So thank you, that's what I wanted to say today. Okay, thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> so we'll move now to our second panelist. Um, our next panelist is my colleague in the German program, Megan K. Tripp. Megan uses the pronouns she, her, hers. 
She is an assistant professor of German and teaches a variety of courses across the German curriculum, as well as a connections course titled Performing Bodies. Her book project examines the intersection of dance and modernist German poetry in early 20th century texts and in contemporary dance performances that incorporate poetry. Her newer projects explore queerness in the realm of German modernist dance. So welcome, Megan. Thank you. And um, thank you for your organizational work, um, Professor Redman and to my colleagues on the panel. Um, so my research looks at the dancing body on the page and the stage in early 20th century German and European modernist contexts, a time marked by rapid societal and technological change and artistic and philosophical breaks with traditional forms of expression. The project I highlight today examines the works and lives of two modernist artists, a dancer and a poet. At stake is an amplification of embodied realities and artistic worlds that are non-heteronormative, as well as outside more common gay and lesbian narratives of the time, and the ways in which this queerness in a European context is inextricably, is inextricable pardon me, from conversations around ethnicity and race. Which freedoms of expression are which bodies granted in which spaces and at which costs? And at this point, I'll pause and share my screen. So neither of the artists I examine are primarily known for their visual art. Each had some degree of formal training and created many pieces, including self-portraits. In the context of a project that explores the intersection of gender expression that does not conform to binary norms, orientalism and performance, I frame self-portraiture as a way to create and represent the self on the page on one's own terms. It is a meditation on the self and its possibility that has particular disruptive potential for female, queer, and marginalized artists working in a male-dominated tradition. Here you see examples of self-portraits by German-Jewish poet Elsa Lasker Schüler and Russian-German modern dancer Alexander Sakharov that blur gender presentation with strong nods toward Orientalist stylings. Viewing them alongside one another, Lasker Schuler's squared jawline, emphasized by a sideways gaze that averts eye contact of the viewer, stands in stark contrast to the soft sketched lines and narrow chin of Sakharov, who faces the viewer. Additional layers come into play via the text underneath Lasker Schuler's drawing, Yusuf Prince Tiba. Prince Yusuf of Thebes is the name of Lasker Schuler's alter ego, a titular figure in a prose collection, the name she frequently signed to letters, and a figure she embodied at readings and cabaret performances, a self that has long challenged scholars. More could be extracted from these portraits, but for now they offer us an entry into the types of gendered, ethnicity-based, and medial boundary crossings performed by these artists. Both Lasker Schuler and Sakharov engage in a self-fashioning that queered gender, ethnicity, and time. Yet in these two prominent modernist examples, androgynous gender expression goes hand in hand with Orientalist fantasy on the part of performers and audiences. There are bodies transgressing, transgressing or queering a number of boundaries, conventions of gender expression, the East-West or Orient-Occident dichotomy, artistic performance and everyday life, avant-garde interpretations of the past, and artistic genres, both in terms of medium and generic conventions within a particular medium, such as dance or writing. It is the simultaneity of these boundary crossings that make Lasker Schüler and Sakharov apt subjects for a study that interrogates how the intersection of gender expression and Orientalism created a space where the artists could more freely express non-normative subjectivities, even finding camaraderie and admiration within artist circles, though not free from racial and gendered stereotypes. This well-known portrait by Alexei Poniaulensky in the Lehnbach House in Munich presents a subjectivity that exists in a space between white, European, and ethnic other, between femininity and masculinity. The painting of Sakharov is said to have been completed in a half an hour during Sakharov's visit to his friend's atelier on the way to a performance. And this anecdote provides an example of a boundary crossing in terms of gender presentation and of art and everyday life. From documentation of the time, we know that as artists, dance critics, and patrons of the arts attended shows and witnessed his brand of modernist dance, Sakharov's gender-bending costumes and performance style became a topic of city gossip in Wilhelmine, Munich, 
not unlike the reception of Elsa Lasker Schüler in the cafe scene in Berlin. Ideas of gender, race, and nation are particularly fraught in the reception of Sakharov, who was praised for his, quote, sharp oriental features and lambasted for being an, quote, effeminate Slav. As scholars like Sarah Ahmed and Joseph Allen Goon remind us, the concept of the Orient is both feminized and sexualized. Effeminacy here is a double-edged sword because the very thing that marks someone like Sakharov as gender non-conforming also orients him toward the feminine, a construct in which fluidity of gender and sexual identity is at times more acceptable or even normalized. Whereas Sakharov's self-fashioning was often lavish, many of Lasker Schüler's contemporaries describe her dress as eccentric and ranging from alluring to peculiar and disheveled. In memoirs like those of art dealer and historian Eduard Pleitsch, contemporaries link this peculiarity to a lack of normative feminine allure and even genderlessness. Quote, people perceived this character who had a boyish body and was slovenly clad in, shall we say, peculiar costumes of her own invention as genderless. Such comments reveal the classist narratives embedded in gendered perceptions of ethnically othered bodies. Despite such criticisms, the multi-layered presentation of their selves through writings, drawings, photographs, performances, ephemera, and artworks by close friends of the art world present a queer counter narrative to historical accounts dominated by white heteronormative cis male writers, while also questioning these transgressive identities moving at the boundaries of binary constructs help to create space for non-normative modernist bodies. Bringing these artists together, we see similar appearances, embodied notions of an alter ego or other half, and modes of artistic creation that blur boundaries of aesthetic performance and everyday life. Lasker Schüler, a well-known poet and one of the only women to break into the masculine realm of expressionism, has enjoyed much scholarly attention, yet is often seen as an anomaly, whereas Sakharov is little known by scholars working outside of the small subfield of modernist German dance studies. The constructs these artists move within and between, in particular gender expression and orientalism, marginalized them, yet provided a degree of freedom. At the same time, these constructs of gender and notions of orientalism are deeply embedded in white European culture. A broader look at the lives and works of these artists reveals that rather than being simply in opposition to normative gender, ethnic, and sexual identities, they are in flux or fluid, which likely contributes to their polarizing effect. By being bodies in flux, they unsettle by forcing those around them to orient themselves according to their queer performance. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Megan. Our final panelist is Giovanna Faleschini Lerner. Giovanna is Professor of Italian and Chair of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies here at FNM. Her research explores questions of race and gender in transnational Italian culture, and especially visual culture, through a focus on the contemporary cinema of migration. Her book, Women and Migration in Contemporary Italian Cinema, Screening Hospitality, is forthcoming with Liverpool University Press. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, too, join my colleagues in thanking the Common Hour Committee, the Faculty Center, and, of course, uh, Professor Redman for putting together this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, my work is on the fundamental human experience of mobility. In my research, I study films that represent the border crossing experiences of transnational migrants and especially women. I focus in particular on the cinema of Italy where the question of migration is seen as the single most important political and social issue of our time and a phenomenon that in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall, the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia has radically transformed Italian society. Until the early 1980s, in Italy, migration primarily meant emigration, both internal along the south-north axis and transnational, with Italians leaving for Northern Europe the Americas and Australia. Analysts and scholars now prefer to use the word migration without any prefixes. 
Indeed, in its radical meaning, migration more accurately reflects the provisional nature of contemporary population movements, their multidirectionality, and especially in the Italian case, the coexistence of large numbers of asylum seekers, refugees, and immigrants arriving in Italy alongside continual domestic migration, the so-called brain drain, and the re-emergence to the public consciousness of the legacies of Italian imperialism and colonialism in Libya, East Africa, Albania, and the Eastern Mediterranean. Anthropologist Michel Ager, among others, has identified this moment of radical change as a crisis of the nation state in the face of global mobility. This crisis is only amplified by the present and overlapping crisis of war in and outside of Europe, racial and gender-based violence, climate change, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. My research explores the ways in which Italian filmmakers have responded to these crises and um, have responded to the calling to question of the definition of the Italian nation itself. In line with the progressive politics of the Italian tradition of socially engaged cinema, most of the Italian films on migration position themselves in alternative to the government's securitarian logic of suspicion and fear in, a, in an attempt to propose instead models of hospitality and welcome toward the stranger as defined by the philosopher Jacques Derrida. Because hospitality is not simply a principle or an industry, but an embodied practice, hospitality is highly gendered and it plays out especially through the maternal body, thus becoming interconnected with questions of reproduction, race, racism, coloniality, and post-coloniality. By focusing on women migrants and their on-screen representations, my research is quite literally about bodies, transgression, and boundaries. Some of the questions I ask in my work are about the ways in which these cinematic representations reflect, reflect perceptions of and construct women's bodies as transgressive. They are transgressive because quite literally, they transgress national boundaries, but they are transgressive also because their bodies do not necessarily fit in with the construction of Italianness as white, and their reproductive power presents a challenge to the conservation of a clear white racial identity within the Italian nation. Migrant women's sexuality is also represented as transgressive because it is often associated with human trafficking and forced sex work. In Giuseppe Tornatore's thriller, The Unknown Woman, a Russian Jewish actor, Ksenia Rapoport, plays in another transgressive move, a Ukrainian woman who has been trafficked into Italy and forced not only into prostitution, but into several unwanted pregnancies. Her infant children have been sold on an illegal adoption wing one after the other. After she manages to escape from her pimp, she starts a quest for her youngest child. Though she is white and thus does not threaten the imagined racial purity of the Italian nation, the fact that she can pass for Italian and so can her children, her work as a prostitute, even though not by her own choice, and her willingness to kill in order to reunite with her child are all symptomatic of the profound unease with which Italian society sees migrant women. As this example suggests, Italian films struggle at times to move beyond representations of women as instrumental to capitalist forms of reproduction and sexual exploitation, and reveal the gendered and sexualized undercurrents that remain prevalent in the cinematic industry. But the focus on migrant women as agents of their own migratory projects also helped destabilize normative arrangements of citizenship and national belonging. This is, this is particularly true of the work of migrant and so-called new Italian filmmakers 
who no longer work alongside the binaries of Italian, non-Italian, but complicate the structures of belonging in the nation and push them toward transnational mobile forms of citizenship. The autobiographical documentary, Me, My Gypsy Family and Woody Allen by Laura Alilovic, um, who is an Italian resident of Roma ethnicity and Bosnian citizenship, explores the tensions between Romanipe, the sense of identity of the Roma people, and Italianness, especially as they pertain to gender expectations and roles. The cinema becomes for Halilovic a place of freedom where she can be both Roma and Italian, a dutiful daughter and a filmmaker. Refusing to let her story be told by someone else, she uses filmmaking to open up new spaces of creativity for the construction of a decolonial imaginary that embraces rather than resists the transgression of linguistic, cultural, national, and gender-based borders. In this sense, new Italian filmmakers like Halilovic connect to the very Italian tradition of neorealism, a cinematic movement that emerged in the wake of World War II as an attempt to build a new nation from the ashes of fascism and shape a new Italy, one that accepts the crisis of the nation in the face of global mobility as an opportunity to recognize that its future is inextricably connected with the future of the planet and all of its inhabitants. By attributing such power to the cinema, Halilovic magnifies the continued relevance and urgency of humanistic critical approaches to representations of transnational mobility and to the ways in which they interpret and construct human experiences of as a response to the demand for engaged humanistic inquiry that our moment imposes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Giovanna. Um, thanks to all three of you. So I'm gonna invite the panelists to all turn their cameras on, come on screen, or I guess you were all there, good. Um, so we have a few minutes to, to, to talk together um, in this strange format, of course, um, about the connections between your um, projects and also what connects your projects to the, the, the broader work and your identities as teachers as well as scholars. Um, but I want to start by picking up where Giovanna left off. She talked about how filmmakers in Italy are grappling with social changes brought about by global mass migration. And as we know, at this very moment, a war is raging, raging in Ukraine and hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced as a result of that war. We're also in year three of a global pandemic, right-wing populism, partly as, as a result of the pandemic is on the rise. And all three of you are faculty members in the languages here at FNM. How can the study of languages and cultures in particular, and perhaps also humanities to connect to Giovanna's final point in general, help us make sense of this incredibly challenging moment that we find ourselves in today? And maybe I'll ask you, Giovanna, to start us off. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, well, I'll start by uh, talking just a little bit about my last point about humanistic perspectives. I think it really matters to recognize that, or it's really important to recognize that uh, the way that storytelling is the way that we make sense of the world and that the, the way that we interpret events that, um, that happen, whether they belong to our past or they belong to our present as stories of migration, displacement and diaspora do really help us um, create contexts in which these events uh, make sense. And so for me, what is interesting about cinema is really that it helps create narratives that um, interpret, but also create new possibilities. And so that's why I ended with 
a reference to a film by a non-technically Italian filmmaker, um, because I think that that appropriation of, of one's voice to tell one's own story uh, is really important. The other point that you make is about language. And I think uh, one interesting feature of all of these uh, films that I consider is that they're multilingual. Uh, there is not, whereas in the, in the Italian film tradition, there is a strong, um, uh, in fact, a strong, vibrant and really creative industry or, or film dubbing. Um, so if you go to the movies in Italy, whatever, uh, 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 film tradition that the movie will come from, it's going to be dubbed into Italian. Um, in these films, instead, there's a relinquishing of that desire to control language through a standardized version of, um, of Italian as the primary language. And on the contrary, there's an embrace of plurilingualism, uh, the idea that people move in and out of linguistic uh, uh, contexts all the time. And, uh, and that is the reality of the world. I think um, most of the world moves in and out of linguistic realms. Uh, a lot of people are bilingual and multilingual and they use one type of language um, within their home families and another type of language uh, to communicate, uh, for example, uh, to, to navigate bureaucracies, state bureaucracies, and so on. Um, these are not only colonial um, and, uh, well, decolonial spaces and post-colonial spaces. And so I, I think the question of language is just part of who we are. Uh, it's not something separate. And, um, and I would encourage uh, folks to think more uh, flexibly, more fluidly, as Megan um, suggested earlier about language in general. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll toss it over to you, Megan. So both thinking about this question of, of language study, cultural study, the humanities, but also how you work between and among languages in your own scholarly, uh, in your own scholarly productivity, if you can talk about that. Sure, happily. Um, yeah, so definitely about um, the stories we tell and the narratives we have, but also the, the language and the self-expression and the movement that we do or don't possess, right? And so in a lot of my work, I'm working heavily in a, in a language bound context of literary studies and in, but also in poetry, which um, pushes against a lot of, at this time, conventions of language and new experimental ways, but also in dance and finding ways to um, communicate about dance in language to push both um, in the classroom and in my research for consideration of broader perspectives of various types of um, self-expression. Um, just even in preparing the PowerPoint today, um, the one of the quotes I use uses the word in German, geschlechtslos, which I chose to translate as genderless, but geschlecht in German can be gender or sex. And there at the time also was not a difference there, right? And so being really conscious also of the deeply embodied roles that we play in the formation of knowledge and then the use of language to convey different truths. And in a longer talk, I would obviously expand upon that, um, but also really thinking about how discourse can be used um, in a lot of different ways to create um, narratives that are both um, terribly violent, but also in ways that challenge those violent narratives, for instance, in a lot of the violent uh, rhetoric around trans bodies right now. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, so Ryan, speaking of bodies <laughs> and stories around them, um, what, would, what would you say to these questions of, of how our work um, helps us understand the moment that we're in? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the, the benefits of a course like this, taking a, a humanities professor approaching these medical texts and scientific texts um, is already um, allows for different kinds of opportunities for, for discussion. So for example, Professor Strick, who introduced all of us today, and I have, he is a historian of medicine, but 
medieval, Renaissance, modern medicine and the conversations we have um, inform, certainly inform my work in the classroom and my, and my research, my research questions. So the opportunity to go interdisciplinarily across the campus has been an enormous benefit. But I think what I, what I can help with as a class assistant, trained as a class assistant in the classroom, is that I can show patterns where students are reliant upon translations of ancient Greek and Latin. Very few of them, some of them have some of, um, of the languages, but most of them do not. And so what I can show them is are patterns of um, text and of connections that can't be seen if you base it solely on translations. So the plague might be disease, might be miasma in three different texts. And so you wouldn't see that those texts are connected, except if I bring them together and say, this is the same word in each of these texts, you can connect a couple of texts that aren't usually say taught. So Oedipus Tyrannus, Oedipus Rex by Sophocles was produced initially the year after the Athenian plague first landed. And so that's not a connection. We have a medical and historical ex explanation and examination of the Athenian plague. And we have a piece of art reflecting reality, reflecting the truth of the Athenian life at that time. That might not be a connection that you make if you don't realize that the same language is used in both of these texts. So I, I, I try to, I think I can bring something to the classroom and to the experience by making connections that might not be readily available if you don't have ancient Greek and classical Latin, which not everybody does. Yes. Right, thanks Ryan. The, actually, your point about you know your connections and what how you work with these texts in the classroom brings me to my next question, and that is, um, you know, a lot of people associate language faculty with you know teaching vocabulary and grammar, um, and so I wanted to ask you, starting with you again, Giovanna, how you how your research. Um, how you connect your, your role as a scholar and your research to your life in the classroom. Thank you, Jennifer. So one of the things that I didn't say in my um, brief uh, introduction to my work was that um, if folks wanted to know more about questions of race, racism, uh, and uh, citizenship and identity in Italy, they should uh, attend my uh, honor student uh, uh, thesis uh, defense, which is on racism in um, professional Italian soccer. And, um, and that's one of the ways in which this particular concern about what it means to be Italian today, who gets to call uh, themselves Italian and who does not, is really at the center of, um, of a lot of my teaching. Uh, I, in, in one of our introductory um, courses in Italian literature, we talk about, again, how are writers classified as Italian or not in bookstores in ways that have repercussions, of course, on the market. Um, and why does a, an Italian citizen of uh, Somali descent uh, get to be placed in the section of the bookstore that is foreign literature instead of being um, placed in the Italian lit section, uh, despite the fact that she writes in Italian all the time. Um, so these are some of the questions that we that I definitely try to bring to the fore in my teaching, but I have to say this is also a direction that a lot of uh, that some um, Italian studies programs in the US have taken in the recent years. Um, and my colleagues too, they work on various kinds of uh, cultural intersections with, for example, um, Professor Lerner works on uh, Jewish Italy. And so he uh, raises questions of who gets, again, to call themselves Italian when they belong to a minoritized and uh, numerically minoritarian population. Um, what happens to uh, translingual 
uh, writers that might work uh, in different languages. Um, so I really think that uh, it's impossible in uh, our contemporary moment not to question definitions of uh, national language, national culture, uh, and not to give space to the experiences of, um, of uh, individuals and populations that really are constantly transgressing boundaries. Thanks. Um, Megan, would you like to weigh in on that question? Yeah, I'll try and weigh in just real quickly so we have some um, audience question time. I would say the two main ways that I see this um, having an effect on my teaching, and um, one on a very kind of meta level is dealing with bodies, particularly bodies that cross all kinds of boundaries. Um, I'm, I try to stay because of that, and I, I know it influences how I teach, attentive to the bodies that cross the threshold of our classroom doors to the way that different bodies move around Franklin and Marshall to conceiving of ourselves, not as simply brains on an intellectual pursuit, but as embodied individuals with that carry language and stories and movement um, and all of these things with us. And so really staying attentive to that and trying when I can to, to draw attention to that in big and small ways. Um, but also in my research, and I think all of us work with images and um, ephemera and letters and texts and literary pieces and all different kinds of things. And so drawing into the classroom, the ability to um, use and expand our understanding of language to talk about all different kinds of human expression in texts um, and feeling like we are able to look at an expanse of different types of um, texts is really important um, in framing lots of narrative cycle. Thank you. Um, yes, mindful of the time. So I'm going to turn things over to Professor Strick uh, for questions from the audience. Thanks. This is really quite extraordinary. There are some questions coming in. Um, the first one from a staff member is very wide open. And I think uh, it would be fair to say it's probably directed to all three of the panelists. What might you say about the migration of women and children from the Ukraine at the current moment? Yeah, who would like to take that on? <laughs> yeah, Jen. I can take that. I can begin with that, and I'll be quick. But one of the things that I have um, that I've found striking, and that I think the press, the European press, has paid a little bit of attention to has been the differential treatment of Ukrainian um, fleeing the war compared to refugees from other parts of the world. And the way that um, one, of the, one of the ways in which, uh, especially the progressive press has emphasized the need to welcome these refugees um, has often been uh, by evoking similarities to um, the appearance of uh, Europeans, um, non, uh, uh, well, white Europeans. And so uh, talking about the, the, the need to extend hospitality to uh, specific populations that share um, racial and uh, even um, religious backgrounds as uh, the rest of uh, white Europeans is really uh, striking. The other point I would make is also that we have read uh, reports of um, Indian and uh, Asian and African medical students, especially getting stuck in Ukraine, not being able to leave the country because uh, priority was given to Ukrainian citizens as they were escaping. And so again, the intersection of um, race, gender, class, uh, religious belonging, uh, is really uh, powerful, I think, in, in evaluating the differential responses that um, we, we as Europeans have given to uh, these populations, displaced populations. 
Our, our next question uh, from a faculty member. Thank you all so much for this enriching discussion. Keep in mind, uh, keeping in mind both your excellent call to think more flexibly and fluidly about language, as well as Professor Lerner's welcome reminder that storytelling is how we make sense of the world. I wondered about the ways the different languages within which you work shape how we think about women's bodies as transgressive. Again, I think that's for everybody. Just chime in, <laughs> whoever would like to take it. I think one of the things that I emphasize in the classroom in the ancient medicine course is the metaphors and analogies that we use in order to explain the human body. So there's often a lot of discussion in these texts about everyday events and mechanisms and observations. So we're limited in our explanation of the world around us based on the images and the, our everyday experiences. So we, there's a, there are discussions of how to understand the human body as a plant with regard to nourishment, or to pick up, back up with my, my, my short talk, menstruation, and it's, and it's description as often being um, um, something that resembles the, the um, sacrifice of an animal. And that's a really stark expression. But if you take into mind that the Greek experience, there were probably 200 or 100 opportunities every year for the sacrifice of an animal. This would be an everyday experience. So it's not something we experience every day, but it's something that can be contextualized and understood every day. So the idea of sex as what it seems like to pour cold water onto boiling water, these are, these are expressions and these are um, ways of talking about the body and the, what happens to the body um, based on um, everyday experience of these, of these particular uh, these particular writers, and they're trying to communicate in that way. So I think that's one way that I'm interested in. And they can, the students can understand how they describe things around them based on their own experience and how, and that they're limited, both limited by, and it can be expressed by those experiences. Other panelists want to respond to that one? Sure, I'll, I'll take this up for a moment. Um, and I know that Professor Mitchell um, shares a lot of language knowledge shared on this panel as well. And so um, on a very basic level, right, there are certain words, say in German, where um, profession words, in my case, dancer, tensar, to make it feminine or to refer to a female, you have to add on an ending, right? So this idea that's kind of embedded in the language of the base form being coded as male, um, that, that you have to do something additive, you have to cross something or add something um, to refer to the female body. Um, but also in thinking, I think even beyond women's bodies as transgressive, but opening up language into ways that are more gender inclusive um, in languages that a lot of us teach at FNM um, in languages that are much more heavily grammatically gendered than English, right? And thinking about what are those different ways um, who is demanding it, what ideas of say linguistic purity, which comes up um, and can easily be connected to gender and race discussions that have come up on the panel, right? And how, how do we then navigate language? And um, at least in the German context, a lot of the push for that um, has come uh, both from the queer community, but also from students and young people on the ground demanding a way to refer to themselves and others. Um, so. I don't know if that helps. And if I may, I just want to add a word about uh, translation and the fact that this particular prefix trans is applicable in our, <laughs> in, in, on our panel has been applied to different kinds of movements. And, um, and so one of the ways in which uh, language is transgressive is also through translation. Um, 
And I, I completely agree with Ryan that translation cannot be the only access point to uh, a text or communication, but translation helps precisely uh, move across borders. Um, and so, and there are different types of translation uh, that, that can happen. And so uh, I would also emphasize that important mechanism of translation as a way of transgressive boundaries. Can I jump in with just one example? I just, I just realized my example. This is my example. My example is that there is a description in the historian Herodotus of a group of men in a particular community who, because of their impotency, take on the, the role of women in the culture. And there's a verb. There's a verb and it actually translates to playing the woman. So there's an example of language where there's, a, there's a, actually a transgression of gender as performance in the verb itself. The men are playing the women. So the masculine subject are verbalized, verbalized as playing the woman. That to me is an example of gender as performance and as performance of role, but also a linguistic example of transgression. That's, that's, that's where I'm at. Would the same verb be used in describing a man playing yeah. the role of a woman in a theatrical production? It would, it would, it would, it could. I don't, I'd actually need to check, but it would be, it is used in other contexts, but that would be the, that would be a, a really fantastic, see Professor Strick, you've come up with another research question for me, so. Well, you, actually your comment about metaphors made me think, particularly in connection with the next question that you're gonna get. Um, I, in the modern abortion debate, a me metaphor that is often used, especially by pro-choice um, uh, arguments is that we, you should think about an acorn compared to an oak tree, right? It, it is, a, is a zygote um, more like an acorn or is it more like an oak tree or in, in the difference between them? Did the ancient Greeks um, have that kind of metaphor? Well, Aristotle was interested in that in the, in the natural world anyway. How is it that an acorn can become an oak tree. <laughs> so there were discussions of, certainly discussions of that, and there were discussions of, of in, the, in the realm of abortion, if that's where you're moving, and contraception. And the question often in antiquity was, are you, are you um, preventing the possibility of another citizen, another potentially freeborn male citizen from the state? So issues of sold, sold, in sold embryo and fetuses comes later in the Christian, Christian era um, with Tertullian and St. Augustine, but it's certainly something that's on their minds. How does one become the other? And that kind of metaphor is as natural, yeah. But I wanna leave it to my colleagues. You'll see right away the connection to the next question. Um, the, uh, this is from a faculty member and it says to Professor Fowler, uh, the emphasis in the ancient texts about men monitoring and controlling women's menstrual cycles is striking in our current moment when Roe versus Wade may shortly be overturned. Do you see ways in which the medicalized validation of women's inferiority is still prevalent in modern medicine? The, especially the use of the mutilated language sounds striking in a modern Western culture that opposes female genital mutilation, but appears yeah. not. Can I, too, can I show an image it. really quickly? So this is from a, a paper from a philosopher from Columbia. And this is um, President Trump and Vice President Pence met in the White House about um, maternity services, reducing coverage for maternity services. And so what this scholar mentions in this based on because of this photo is that um, these experts on the matter seemed unconcerned to ask women for their opinion. This is a group of, of men in the room specifically discusses discussing maternity services um, for, um, for families. So I think this is, a, this is an example. This is a connection that can be made now. Um, there are too many examples of justifications of treatment of women in the modern era 
um, based on Hippocratic Corpus and Galenic texts that to name. So I, I would want to mention it to, or I would hand it over to my colleagues. But um, yes, I think there are, we are living in the shadow of Hippocrates and Galen medically, in my opinion. Other panelists want to pick up on that? <clears throat> uh, I can't resist mentioning that the ancient medicine course in which you get a chance to read these texts is being offered again in the second summer session this year um, in case people want to read more about Aristotle yeah. and Galen. Anybody can take that. <laughs> I hope you sign up. I've it's heard great. that even faculty members. It's great, absolutely. It's great course. fun. It's, ex it's <laughs> extraordinary opportunity. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Actually, to, actually I Jimmy, if I, may, if I may, just what what uh, Professor Fowler was uh, discussing reminded me of the question of reproduction and again racial purity that is so important in. Um, in, especially in the Italian context right now, because we uh, as a nation are facing a demographic decline. Um, and so the idea is that immigration will help um, create new citizens in a sense, as uh, Professor Fowler uh, suggested. And at the same time, citizenship laws are so restrictive that um, in fact, children born to non-Italian uh, passport holders in Italy are not citizens and have, apply, and have to apply for citizenship. And, but at the same time, if one of your grandparents here was an Italian citizen, you have the right to Italian citizenship. And so there is this tension between the need for uh, a renovated nation, renovated blood, and at the same time, the resistance to, uh, to including in the process of, of, uh, of citizenship uh, newcomers. And the other thing I wanted to say is that there is a striking moment in one of the films that I talk about where well before the pandemic, we see a, a search and rescue mission in the Mediterranean and the search and rescue workers are all dressed in uh, all body hazmat suits as they help uh, children, women, and men uh, disembark a um, shipwrecked vessel. And that idea, that um, medicalization of uh, migration, the idea that migrants bring disease, that migrants are disease themselves to the nation, I think has become particularly dramatic in um, the context of the pandemic, where, uh, where that has made this, uh, where the pandemic has made this equivalence particularly evident. And at the same time, it is a narrative, a discourse um, that existed well before the pandemic. And the pandemic has only uh, sort of exploded it in our faces. There's a long history of governments worrying about pandemic contamination and worrying about demographic problems, at which time they seem often to take an extraordinary interest in controlling women's bodies. Uh, I'm sorry to say that we're out of time, um, but it's been a really exciting panel and uh, we really must do this again sometime soon. Thanks everybody. And uh, again, uh, thanks to Emily for interpreting. Um, thanks to the Faculty Center for proposing the idea. And uh, thanks to the audience um, who I hope will join us again next week for the conductors of FNM with Brian Norcross and many student conductors. See you next week. <laughs>